I thought he was the most remarkable person I'd ever met. I mean, he was so uh, full of ideas and dynamism and everything, and everybody wondered what he was going to do. You know, what, what, what was, how was he going to cash in on all this talent that he had? Those of us who were in our 20s in the 1960s, they seemed the coolest, funkiest, most sophisticated things we'd ever read. Uh, much more so, in many ways, than uh, Ian Fleming's books. The thing about Len Dayton is he actually wrote about working-class heroes in a world that I understood. You always felt that you'd be sitting on a bus and the guy sitting next to you might well be an intelligence officer on his way to work. Len Dayton, the spy writer, that's what most people have in their mental stock of cliches, if you like. Uh, and it's a total lie. There's no such thing as truth. There's just a, a universally acceptable lie. Um, and that is really what I've tried to say in the books, I said. There were three of them, Ian Fleming, John le Carre and Len Dayton. It was the early 1960s. The Cold War was hot. There was a new wall across Berlin. Spies were everywhere, and so were books and films about them. But elsewhere, there were signs that the old class system was beginning to crack. There were four lads from Liverpool with funny haircuts, and there were girls with short skirts. And it was Len Dayton, born in a workhouse, as he is proud to remind you, who was to make all the right connections. The theme of the 50s, as I remember it, was a theme of disillusion. I don't mean everybody walked around with a sour face and everything, but in England, when we look back now, if I describe what it was like in the 50s, you'd think it was a horror story, you know. But, of course, we'd come at, we were comparing it with the 40s, and so compared with the 40s, compared with the 40s it was great. You know? <laughs> and that's why when the 60s came along, it was so amazing that all of a sudden we had miniskirts and discos and the Beatles and everything caught fire. So the mood changed to a mood of tremendous self-confidence. Dayton created one of the decade's defining characters and went on to write a whole string of bestsellers over the next 30 years. He showed that men could cook, he wrote and produced two major films, and then he went on to tear up the orthodox history of the Second World War and retell it in a way which has not been seriously challenged since. He was everywhere. But for all the social changes, he still found Britain claustrophobic. From 1969, when he left Britain, Dayton moved restlessly from place to place, initially in Europe. Now, he and his family spend most of their time in Southern California, steering well clear of any media engagements and enjoying the sunshine lifestyle. I like Americans. I mean, I like Americans wherever I meet them. I find they're, they're friendly, they're tolerant, they're interested in, in everything. They adopt a very open attitude to culture, wherever they find it. They're very easy, very easy to make. They're WD-40 of the world, the Americans. As a child, I, earning a living was the prime thing. My parents worked hard, my mother worked hard, my father worked hard. They gave me everything that they could, uh, that they could afford to give. The, what kind of response would that be to my parents if I didn't work hard? When young Leonard came along in 1929, his father was in service, chauffeur and mechanic to Campbell Dodgson, keeper of prints and drawings at the British Museum. His mother was a cook, part of London's vast anonymous army of domestic staff. When he came to write the book that was to change his life 30 years later, it was all filtered through that background. His hero was so ordinary that he didn't even have a name. He was the spy who came in from the street. I started with the Epcrest file, uh, went on to a funeral in Berlin, 
Horse Underwater, uh, The Billion Dollar Brain, all of sort of uh, early spy stuff. And it was brilliant because it was the first time I'd read a thriller writer who'd concentrate in a world that, that I knew. I mean, prior to that, I'd read um, uh, The Saint books by Leslie Charteris, and I'd read Ian Fleming, James Bond, and I'd read Le Carre. And they're all great writers, but they operated in worlds that, that I was never going to see. You know, James Bond is in his dinner jacket playing Baccarat in Monaco. Um, you know, uh, Le Carre has got his Oxford Dons sort of meeting in Whitehall. And suddenly you've got a hero who lives in a bed set and is shopping in a supermarket and is travelling on the bus. And it, was, it, it just made it that much more real. Struck me working class lads in the 60s is what the 60s were all about. I mean, it was the working class saying, we're not going to take it anymore, you know. And we're going to do this, and if you want to join us, join us. If you don't, stay where you are. He wrote The Ipcrest File with the idea of producing something that was counter-cultural to the, the Ian Fleming, James Bond ethos, which was that of the sort of polished gent who um, came from a rather superb foreign office and everything, you know, worked terribly well. The majority of Len's books are about one subject, which arises from his lowly start in life, if you like, and that is hypocrisy. The spy world is ruled by mandarins, if you like, and Len dislikes the mandarin thing. I think he found that the whole structure of MI5 and the world of Burgess and MacLean the, the upper class uh, aspect of, of, of their, their background, all Oxford graduates, or maybe they were Cambridge, I'm sorry, I don't remember which. Um, that was something that I, I think he, he got pretty impatient with and liked to really uh, lampoon that, if you like, in, in the Ipcrest file. The class structure, I think, irritated him immensely. It still does. When I first started writing, I wrote half of Ibcrest file, and then I didn't do anything about it until I went on holiday again a year later. And then I, I used it as a doorstop. Um, I mean, it, it, I, I had no intention of getting it but It was just a fun thing to do, to pass away the time on holiday. And if I hadn't, I was at a party, I met a man called Jonathan Clues, and I said, what do you do for a living? And he said, I'm a literary agent. And I said, wow, imagine that, this is your lucky day. Um, that, and, <laughs> He didn't seem to see it that way, but he agreed reluctantly to, uh, to read this garbage through, and uh, so I gave it to him. So I don't think I had any driving, uh, driving force. I think if I had not gone to that party, I had not met Jonathan Clues, I think that probably uh, I wouldn't have become a writer. Dayton was already an established commercial artist when he wrote The Ipcrest File. The war had interrupted his formal schooling, but during his national service in the RAF, he was able to study photography and on demobilization got a grant to go to St. Martin's School of Art. As it happened, he was part of a generation which was to become the stars of mid-20th century British art. Frank Harbach, Leon Kossoff, Peter Blake, Mel Kalman and others. I was content, more or less, to be an artist. And since I wasn't a wonderful artist, I had a long way to go. So I, I think I would have gone on trying to be a better and better and better artist because that everything was directed within me to try and produce a better a better product uh, which I've always been keen to do and when I wrote books I tried to write a better and better product all the time then. We were both doing uh, book jacket designs for Andre Deutsch and for Penguin Books. He was an illustrator more than a painter. He was in the graphic design school at St Martin's he was very, very good at grasping the, the absolute essence of a subject and translating it into pen and ink. I'm still an art student, really. I'm not a writer. The, 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 um, anything that's, that is good in my books it tends to be descriptions that an art student would provide, you know, that, because art students look, art students are not people who draw well, especially today, but the art students are people who observe carefully, and it's observation. I, think. I remember a, a, an instructor that I had who said, don't start to draw something until you walked around it, and I tell you, you can't always do that, but uh, he was right in saying that, that you know, this 
three-dimensional thing is, uh, uh, is awfully important. When Dayton did finally turn to writing, what he came up with quickly caught the imagination. I was at my desk one day at the Daily Express in Fleet Street, and a friend of mine, Ray Hawkey, came to me and said, look, would you read this? And he plonked a manuscript on my desk. I said, what is it? He said, it's a terrific thriller by a friend of mine. I thought, oh, God, here we go. Read a friend's manuscript, you know. But Ray was a great friend, and I knew he had great taste, and we both shared similar tastes in books. And I read it immediately that night, and to my delight, obviously, and surprise, I thought, God, this is a good book. This is a wonderful book. It had a great quality to it. Very unusual in, in English writing. It had a, a, a speed, a narrative drive, and great characters. The great thing about uh, Len Dayton's hero, I mean, in the, the movie, he's Harry Palmer. Uh, in the book, he's, he's, he's not named. Um, is that he's not fired up with patriotism. He does the job because it's his job. Uh, he starts off as a, a soldier who moves into military intelligence. He then moves into the intelligence services. Uh, and although he does the job professionally, he doesn't do it out of some sense of patriotism or for the greater good in the way that Le Carre's heroes operate. He does it because it's his job. And one of the things I've found over the years uh, writing about these guys is that's what it's like. They don't join uh, the custom service or the police service or in the intelligence services because they see it as a battle between good and evil. They do it because it's a job. He's worried about his expenses. He wants his petrol allowance. Uh, he's annoyed because he's, he's bought in on his, on his days off. The very day it was published, Harry Schwartzman, who was a well-known film producer at that time, called me and said, are you telling the truth about this guy? So I said, well, what do you mean? He said, is it as cracked up as you, you know, implied is? I said, it's a great book, Harry. He said, you better give me his number. And the phone went and um, Len uh, said, oh, no, no, I'm here, I've just cracked a bottle of champagne and celebrate my the publication of my novel, and I said, good God, because I didn't know the novel, the novel was on the shelf last time, having been submitted to all sorts of publishers who hadn't had the wit to see the merit in it. And um, he said, uh, as I was driving to Pinewood to discuss the film rights with Harry Saltzman, the phone in my car rang, and it was Newsweek, who wanted to do a profile. I said, oh yeah, what happened later on, you know? <laughs> What you've got to understand is the literature at that time was always about the middle class and, and then suddenly there's working class dialogue and working class characters and it was very exciting to find one and, and, and Harry, as he became known eventually, was one of those and I was reading bits to Terence Stamp who I shared a flat with and I said, I said, I could play this, listen, listen to this, this is me, I could do this. He said, you'll never get it, you'll never get it, Michael. But I did, I did. <laughs> Stand to attention. At ease. Uh, is that my B-107, sir? As if you didn't know. And it makes awful reading, Perman. You just love the army, don't you? Oh, yes, sir. I just love the army, sir. I was very, very similar to uh, Harry Palmer. Um, I was very chippy from a class point of view, particularly. I'm still chippy from a class point of view. Uh, uh, and um, I, I was chippy about discipline I could, because I was a national service. I was a private in the army. In, in the, I wasn't a private, I was a fusilier. I was in the Royal Fusiliers. We weren't privates. And um, so I was very chippy with the officers. Who I, so I was reading a book in the SAS, they call them Ruperts. Isn't that a lovely... Because every officer I ever met was called Rupert. <laughs> I mean, there was a time, it's difficult to believe that. Before the film came out, Michael was still a struggling actor while I was a famous... It was just a brief period of time, you know, then of course he overtook me like a skyrocket, but there was just a brief period of time when I was more famous than Michael, you know. And Peter Evans once said that I'm at parties and I see Len and Michael eyeing each other and saying, where would I be now without him? And the, I, I think there's perhaps a, an element of that. I mean, uh, Michael, uh, you know, I, we're not, uh, we don't see each other on a regular basis, but we're Londoners, we're, we're, um, we, we understand each other very much. I mean, Michael once said to me, because you're a, a, 
you're a perfectionist. He said, that's what's so good about you. And I said, Michael, don't say that, because I can't think of one thing I've ever done that has satisfied me. And Michael said, that's what I mean. Knowing as a designer that books were judged by their covers, Dayton called up Ray Hawkey, his former art school friend, by then design director of the Daily Express, to shake up the outside of books, just as he was changing the inside. But what was considered particularly innovating about the Ipcress file is that prior to that, publishers were very reluctant to spend any money at all on jackets. And what I did with the Ipcress file is to apply magazine and advertising techniques to it, um, which was an immense success. And, uh, it has really since then been very widely imitated. In fact, most bookshops, when one goes in now, there's more sort of artillery laid out. When Ray did this cover for my first book, the prejudice in the book trade against white jackets, I can't tell you. I mean, that they didn't want to know about white jackets. I mean, it had got to a point where, although it started out that white jackets became soiled, it had become some kind of mystic thing that if you had a white jacket, that was going to be like a bad luck totem. You know, the, the, the book trade is a bit, or was, a bit prone to these sort of uh, mystic predictions. And, of course, they were always self-fulfilling. In fact, the white covers were to become famous in their own right, and they weren't the only innovation. It was Ray's idea that if you bought the hardback book, you were likely to find one of these uh, things inside it, like SSGB, there were... Uh, postage stamps with Hitler's head, You're beautifully done, so uh, it, get, it gets written up in stamp collectors' magazines and things like that, e extraordinary. And then there was one where there was a file of documents and uh, some smart house in Canada tried to sell it. Uh, in fact, I think he successfully sold them to the, to the Russian embassy. The Russians, or the Soviet Union anyway, were definitely the enemy at the time and everyone knew where the front line was. The parade ground of Europe has always been that vast area of scrub and lonely villages that stretches eastward from the Elbe. Some say as far as the Urals. But halfway between the Elbe and the Oder, sitting at attention upon Brandenburg, is Prussia's major town, Berlin. Berlin, 1961. Why have the Russians built this wall? Why are all Berliners denied the right, guaranteed them under the international agreements, to pass freely from zone to zone within Berlin? Now, if you have two massive systems, which are very good, one you might call Anglo-American or capitalist or whatever you want to call it, and then you have another system